Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson here from ZeldaDungeon.net, and you are watching my video walkthrough for The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass for the Nintendo DS. In the last section of the Temple of the Ocean King we completed, we got the Northeastern Sea Chart, which gives us access to the Northeast Quadrant. Now something that's kind of weird about that though is the last part of the game you can do in a variety of different orders because you can get the Southeastern Sea Chart and the Northeast Sea Chart at the same time. So you can not actually do Northeast Quadrant first, and then do the Southeast Quadrant. So it's a little unusual, like most people go to the Southeast Quadrant first. You have to pass through the Southeast Quadrant and even get to the Northeast Quadrant. So it is a little odd, but it's kind of more of a like a pro option or like a second playthrough option, basically. Um, so most people traditionally, if this is your first time playing, you probably aren't doing things out of order like that. So Harrow Island is basically just gambling. You talk to the Gossip Stone, pay its fee, and then you can dig around in here for up to 10 treasures. After that, you need to leave. If you dig more than 10, then you're in trouble and he'll charge you rupees for it or whatever. So you don't want to over dig. And the, the trick with that too is it is a certain number of treasures you dug up, not a certain number of holes. So you just keep digging until you find things and it'll warn you. It'll say, hey, by the way, you only have one left or whatever. One of the other things you can do here is you can, can find Lucky Lee, who is a spirit that lives here and it just lets you gamble again. And you get to choose, it's a multiple choice thing. And basically though, Lucky Lee is actually a tends to win money. So in that case, for example, I paid 50 rupees and I ended up only gating back 40. So I lost 10 rupees total as a net uh, value. Um, however, I will say that if I won, it would have been like 200 rupees or something like that. So like the potential of losing 10 rupees versus gaining 200 rupees is just a better deal. However, a lot of times, at least in this playthrough, when I, I did, played more at Harrow Island that isn't shown in this recording, but um, a lot of times in my experience, what happened here is I lost with Lucky Lee a lot. He would just say, oh, you won nothing and uh, nothing happened. So my experience with Lucky Lee hasn't been super great, but I've had a lot of people tell me that overall the amount you gain on it is way superior, so it's definitely worthwhile. Anyway, once you find both treasure maps, that is all we have to do here. I was actually super lucky in this particular recording, so that's all great. I got them both in this first try. So I'm going to go ahead and dig up the remaining treasures, hopefully finding something good. It didn't actually end up really super working out in my favor. But then go ahead and leave Harrow Island once you've gotten the two treasure maps. Otherwise, what you have to do is you actually just sail away and then sail back to Harrow Island to start the game again. You can't just, like, leave and talk to the Gossip Stone. You have to actually sail, which is kind of weird. But you just keep going to Harrow Island repeatedly until you have both treasure maps. The Golden Frog for this quadrant is actually off to the right. It's, like, kind of in between the two islands and a little bit to the south. Or if the uh, islands themselves were points on a triangle, for example, the, the last point would be the Golden Frog. It's kind of like how you find that. We also have another enemy here, which you may have seen in the Southeast Quadrant a little bit, um, called Gyorgs, and these, like, purpley pink fish will chase after you and try and munch on you. And they can be killed with the cannon shots, however, they are kind of difficult to hit, honestly. I think it's pretty hard to do so, and you'll probably just take a bunch of damage in the process, so my vote for them to deal with them is to just avoid them entirely. Like, just jump over them and ignore them, because once you get far enough away from, like, wherever they spawn from, then they'll just disappear anyways, so you don't even have to deal with them. So I just ignore them and then just continue on with my sailing around. So in each quadrant there is a traveler ship, and I find that title really confusing and misleading because uh, there's one in each quadrant and they each contain something different, so the only way to differentiate them is just knowing, like, which one is different in each quadrant. <laughs> so anyways, the one in the northeast quadrant belongs to the Man of Smiles. So when you arrive, you'll see that it's infested with enemies and we need to defeat them all. I actually really like stuff like this when they have interesting enemy combinations. You don't really see this in dungeons so much, they usually just have one type of enemy and there's like a couple of them in a room, like at most four. And they usually don't have any more than that. And part of the reason for that is so that the DS doesn't lag because it can't handle too much stuff happening at once. Uh, it just wasn't powerful enough for that at the time. Uh, but anyways, um, so I do like having a bunch of enemies together like this. I think it provides some interesting strategies. But even just interesting combinations of enemies where it's kind of difficult, I think it like adds to some like puzzle element in Zelda games, you know? Where like an enemy by itself might not necessarily be that big a deal, but when you combine it with something else, then it makes this new dynamic that you don't normally see. So once you've defeated them all, the door will open and the Man of Smiles will make an appearance. Now this dude actually will give you something as reward, but you have to talk to him repeatedly. So just keep talking to him. When he stops, ends the conversation, just talk to him over and over again. And eventually he will give you a treasure map as well as a side quest item.
So at this point, he then asks you if you want something mysterious or something normal, and actually what he's going to do is give you both, so regardless of which one you choose, he will give you both prizes. The mysterious option is the hero's new clothes, which are... nothing? <laughs> uh, you'll find out what that means here in a little bit, but the, he'll give you the normal thing as well, which is a treasure map. So how this trading sequence works is you need to give the items to the other traveler ship owners. So there's one in each quadrant and they each want something different. So in this example, this one was the hero's new clothes. So who could want the hero's new clothes except for the hero, obviously. So you want to go to the northwest quadrant and set sail for the traveler ship there. So we got a kaleidoscope. Now, it's kind of weird, but as we know, the ho-hos on the traveler ship in the southeast quadrant use telescopes all the time. So set sail for there, and hopefully one of them will want this item too. So as long as you're here, you should try selling treasure to the leader who is to the far north. Now, this dude, actually, he wants Rudo crowns this time, which is kind of weird because the date has changed a couple times since then. It just happened to land on that treasure, which I sold him all my Rudo crowns since then. And I thought that was several chapters back, so I was like, really? I, th I don't have any more Rudo crowns since then? But apparently not. I could have changed the date on my console so that he was actually buying something that I would have, but it didn't really matter too much anyways. I guess it's not really too surprising. I mean, treasures as opposed to ship parts are typically the lower tier prizes for minigames. So I have been only scoring high on minigames and I haven't been playing very many games in general. I've just like been scoring high and then just leaving as soon as I get the good stuff. So uh, I just haven't acquired a lot of treasure in general. So fun fact for you too, by the way, when you draw a path to a boat, like Beetle's boat, for example, if you connect with it and it's like, do you want to sail here? Then you say yes. And what happens is if you're actually connecting, like that's your destination, then whatever boat you're sailing to will actually stop moving at that point, which is kind of odd if you think about it. But anyways, um, I guess it's just they don't keep going farther away from you or whatever. But if you instead you draw a path near them, like I'm doing in this video right here, then that boat will continue sailing on whatever its path is. Now that boat just goes north and south over and over again. It just kind of goes in like a really narrow circle or like narrow left and right anyways it goes up and down really far so i was purposefully not drawing a path to it at first so that it would continue sailing north i don't know how much time that saved but it's the thought that counts right the traveler ship in the southwest quadrant is owned by knave the guard of the sea patrol or whatever so this guy is supposed to be protecting the sea from monsters and he's not doing a very good job he's playing dead and meanwhile his boat is infested with monsters so you can defeat them all and he will give you treasure as reward now, the number of monsters actually changes a little bit, I believe. They get harder as the game progresses. And uh, when you defeat them all, he will give you treasure, and you just talk with him repeatedly. He's playing dead, so you have to talk with him a bunch of times. But eventually he'll get up and he'll give you treasure. Um, and I believe I remember there being a stockpile of treasure if you haven't been here yet. So I think he only gave me one piece of treasure right now. But I think if I leave and come back, he'll give me a whole bunch of them or something, or... Anyway, so that's something you can do. I was just talking about how I didn't have any treasure, and yet this is one of the ways, especially early game, that you could have done that. 
Anyway, because Knave is a guard, and because we have the guard notebook, then this is probably where it belongs. And he's just the type who would just kind of lose something like that, I guess, too. He's kind of irresponsible, so it kind of makes sense that we'd find it floating out in the water or whatever. So this next item is a little bit vague, but we just got the wood heart, which is apparently some kind of ration that they eat out on the high seas and r reminds people of sailing or whatever. So who do we know who is totally infatuated with sailing and having adventure and stuff like that? And there's only one person that comes to mind. So make way for Bannon Island and go to the Old Wayfarer. So once you arrive, though, you will see that the Old Wayfarer isn't there. So you want to go talk with Joanne instead, who says that he has left and is continuing his wayfaring ways. She also says that you can hand in fish with her from now on because he's not going to be here, which is actually kind of convenient. So if you find Neptune or whatever, you can bring it to her and she'll give you that heart container. Which sort of brings up an interesting point. I guess you can't even do this portion of the side quest unless you've at least started the fishing side quest so that Joanne is there in the hut. Um, otherwise, you would have nobody to hand it into. And it also makes me curious, like, what would happen? Like, does that mean if you never went to Bannon Island, like, say you're doing a minimalist run and you didn't go to Bannon Island at all or didn't talk with the old wayfarer whatsoever? then Joanne would not be in the kiddie pool. So does that mean you just can't do this portion of the side quest? Or, like, is she just not in the pool? I'm assuming that it just, you can't even do that portion of it. Like, you can't give him the wood heart. Um, I don't know, it's just kind of weird. So if anybody in the comments knows what happens if you don't do fishing at all, but then you do traveler ship later in the game, that'd be kind of handy. Um, so if you could share with the group, that'd be lovely. So in the southeast quadrant, we now have a second traveler ship, and this one belongs to the old Wayfarer. So the one off to the right is just the Ho-Ho's. They're still doing their Ho-Ho-y thing. And then off to the far left, we have this one, which is the old Wayfarer. So he is continuing in his wayfaring ways, and he is venturing out on the sea. So talk with him, and he will eventually come to the point where he asks you if you have found romance out on the sea. So say yes, and this will give you the option to offer him the wood heart. You know, because nothing says romance like a heart made of wood. I thought it was supposed to be chocolate. Like, nothing says romance like chocolate. Nothing. So at this point, when he finishes his spiel, he'll give you a simple thank you as reward, which is, of course, not good enough. So to speak with him again over and over again until eventually he tells you to leave because he's flat broke. He just finished telling us all that. So go ahead and head for the stairs and he will actually call out to you and say that he has a prize after all. But it's not here. It's back on Bannon Island. So once you're done talking with him, you can finally leave and return to Bannon Island to get the prize, which is in his house. Now, one comment about this, I'm not sure if, uh, like, what triggers him calling out to you on the stairs is the fact that you talk with him over and over again, but just to be on the safe side, I would recommend you do that. Just keep talking to him until he starts repeating himself, and that's how you know you've at least progressed far enough that you can get the prize. So when you return to Bannon Island, you will encounter another giant eye plant. What does that even mean, anyways? How do they reproduce? Is it just, like, do they leave a bunch of eyeballs and that's, like, their seeds? Like, you're digging around and you're like, <laughs> Or perhaps just the citizens of Phantom Hourglass just are really bad at naming things. They're not very original, but I don't know that they have much choice. Like, so many enemies have eyes that are very prominent in their features. It's kind of like little kids. They sort of find it humorous when you show them a bunch of Pokemon when they're really little and ask them, like, what is this? They're like, uh, red dog, <laughs> yellow dog. <laughs> oh, okay. 
They have such a small repertoire of words to work with, you know. And then shortly after that, they have a huge repertoire of uh, animal words, you know, and sounds. They got all those things figured out, as well as where they are in the world, too. That one's in Antarctica. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. When fighting giant eye plants, you just want to draw a path around them. You don't have to. This just makes it easier to dodge some of the attacks. Although you can't dodge when you're like at the end of the path. They're on the edges to the far north and far south. So it's kind of worthless for that portion of it. Anyways, usually better off just trying to attack all the projectiles regardless. But attack the eye whenever you get a chance. All right. Now this prize is awesome. So this gives you the swordsman scroll, which allows you to use the great spin. How you do that is you just perform three spin attacks in a row, and when you spin the fourth time, you'll actually, instead of just getting dizzy like you used to, you will instead be able to spin around a whole bunch, and you can just continually spin until you finally become dizzy. But in the meantime, you can draw a path around and just move around and attack enemies, and it does a significant amount of damage. It's amazing against bosses, and uh, just does a lot of damage. It's just really, really powerful. Now be warned, you can still get electrocuted and stuff from enemies. If you bonk into something solid, then it will stop your spinning as well. Uh, but anyways, it does do a really good job of killing stuff, and sort of an interesting thing, I didn't really even consider this before, but this might be one really big advantage to going and getting both the Northeast and Southeastern Sea Charts at the same time in the Temple of the Ocean King, because you can go to the Traveler ship sooner so you can get the Swordsman Scrolls. I didn't really consider that, but that would make the Goron Temple and the Temple of Ice easier, as well as just fighting the Yuk in particular. You can kill them really, really fast probably that way. Although at the same time you put a bomb in their mouth and they're vulnerable anyways. It's, it's, that's the problem. Like a lot of enemies in this game, like once you make them vulnerable, then there's not really too much to it. Like you just keep smacking away at them and that's it. I find it sad because it feels like it just makes the sword and scroll and the uh, spirit of power not as useful as they could be, I guess. I, I don't know. It's just like the enemies they have aren't really super conducive for the items and powers that you have available to you. So now that we've completed that portion of the side quest, if you go back to the Man of Smiles in the Traveler ship in the Northeast Quadrant, you can now see that there is enemies infested here again. So go ahead and defeat them. And it is kind of suspicious. That guy, he just like, isn't even on his boat and he comes in after the fact. Like, unlike uh, Knave, you know, who's being a coward, like this guy, it almost makes me wonder if he's inviting them here on purpose or something. Like, oh dear, how did that happen? Like, I, I don't know. It seems suspicious to me. Is he actually like some mastermind or like, working with the bad guys or something. I don't know, you know what I mean? <laughs> it just seems way too suspicious to me. So the Great Spin is really cool. Unfortunately, like, what you'll notice is, like, it bonks on shields and stuff like that, so there's some enemies that you think, like, oh, this will be awesome for that guy. It actually doesn't really work at all. And then there's, like, electric choo-choos here, so it's just kind of like, I don't know, you're all excited to use it, but at the same time, a lot of times when you could use it, it's not as useful as you'd think it would be. <laughs> so it is a really cool weapon, but it's almost like it would have been better earlier in the game, honestly. So when you help the Man of Smiles, he will give you the prize postcard. Now, how this works is you can put it in any mailbox, and then later you will get a prize in the mail. Now, if you win the drawing, you will get a picture with a congratulations, whatever, so it's actually kind of worthless. What you actually want to do is you want to lose the drawing because you will get ship parts as consolation. So you actually want to send in the prize postcards and ideally you lose. Um, but what happens is when you submit a prize postcard, the prize postcard is consumed and you can go back to the Man of Smiles to earn another prize postcard by defeating enemies again. So I will be throwing that in a mailbox at the earliest opportunity, but otherwise you want to sail to the far north where we have another place to discover, Maze Island. So how this maze works is as soon as you begin, it will briefly show the locations of the Gossip Stones. And you need to run forward and smack them. And it doesn't really matter what order you do them in. You can do them in whatever order you want. And there's different ways to do it. Um, but there is definitely some routes that are more efficient than others. And there's some like bridges you have to extend and some spikes you need to put down and stuff like that too. So you can't just go straight to the locations. There is some other objectives other than the Gossip Stones. So there's more things than just that to do. So just be aware of that. So one thing you want to do, though, is it will briefly show the locations of the Gossip Stones as soon as you start. So what you want to do is you actually want to pull up your map and draw, like, mark the locations of the Gossip Stones. And also mark the locations of any points of interest. So any uh, crystal orbs that will activate bridges and stuff like that, you want to write all that stuff down. Now this is timed, we don't have a lot of time, but one thing I will encourage you to do is use your map often. Because when you're looking at your map, time is actually paused. So you can totally just press down on the D-pad or the A button or whatever to pull up your map. And then you can just assess where you want to go. So rather than like going the wrong way and being like, oh no, wait, no, 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 no. And panicking and trying to figure out what to do. I would recommend you pause more often and then just decide what you want to do at that point. 
All right, beginner course, here we go. You wanna do the far left one. You can either do it first or last is most efficient. And it's up to you to decide which way you wanna do that. And part of the reason I say that is because you need to go to this far left area to get back onto the uh, upper platform at some point. So this is probably gonna be one of the ones you're gonna do. So it'll make sense here in a little bit. Continue on to the right, there is an orb over here to the far right. You wanna hit that, this will lower the spikes. This makes a nice shortcut. I would highly recommend you use this shortcut and continue on to the right and here's the second gossip stone. And there's actually another secret you can use here too. You can lay down a bomb here to blow up this wall and this will create a little shortcut that we will use from now on. So I would recommend you blow it up with your sword. You will take damage when you do this if you're too close, but that's okay. Hit this eye switch here. This will create a bridge as well as lower the spikes, which gives us access to the third gossip stone. Now this eye switch, you pretty much want to hit every time that you do one of these um, courses. Now before you continue on, you want to blow up the wall just to the north to find a chest containing a wisdom gem. Now you can get this at any point during any of the courses, but the beginner course, you definitely have the most amount of time. It's definitely the easiest, super chill, so I would highly recommend you do it now. And now just continue on to the fourth gossip stone. There's not really much else to say about this one, it's pretty straightforward. Once you've smacked them all, this will create a chest in the far middle, and we'll have to work our way to that before the timer expires. Now, as I was saying before, the far left gossip stone, you could have gotten it either first or last, and here's what I mean by that. As you continue working your way to the left, you'll find a ramp that leads up to this platform, but from here, you can actually jump to the left, and that's where that gossip stone was. So you can go smack it, then come back on the ramp and work your way over here. So jump across to the middle, and then finally open the chest. So yeah, I would encourage you to draw on your map and pause often. You don't have to like do it all in one go. You can totally just like uh, like pause and then assess where you want to go and then move a little bit more and then pause again. I would really just encourage you to look very, very carefully at your map and decide what you want to do for each step of the way. Um, you don't have to like do it all real time. Real time is definitely a lot harder, which is what I did for this recording, but yeah, it's, it's intense. Alternatively, if you don't want to do any drawing yourself, you could always just look at my map and you could just like pause your game by using the map on your screen and then play the video and then pause the video and then unpause your game and then play a little bit. You know what I mean? You can just alternate back and forth and that way you could just make it all through in one try and uh, that would be another way to do this too if you don't want to like do it the legit way, I guess. So the second route is a little bit different. We have more gossip stones to hit and you actually want to go to the far north first and part of the reason for this is because you want to hit this eye switch which extends a bridge. So you want to go here first and get this one to the far north is what I'd highly recommend. And at this point there is actually a switch you can use off to the right that will lower the spikes but we don't need to go that way. I don't think it's quite as efficient so I'm going to go down here instead and back the route that I took before. Part of the reason for this is, generally speaking, the far bottom right corner of the map is much easier to go through if you're going like counterclockwise through the map, so I highly recommend you go that way first. And uh, so what you want to do here is hop down here, grab this gossip stone, and then go hit that switch to lower the spikes. There is one more extra step we have to do this time. I was trying to save time and shoot a bow here, and it didn't really work so well. But anyways, hop down, and there's another crystal orb across the way, and we want to shoot this with an arrow. We didn't have to do this last time because we weren't required to go through there, so it didn't matter. But now we need to access that area, so that's why I'm shooting that orb. I'm going to go ahead and smack this gossip stone, and again, because I made that shortcut with, by blowing up that wall, we can go through here too. Once again, you want to smack this eye switch. This will extend the bridge and lower the spikes, which allows us to go both right and left at the same time. So we can go either way. Um, you can pick either direction. I think it's better to go to the right and then swing around to the left side. At this point, the rest of it is pretty straightforward. And like I was saying, the bottom right in particular is what makes this whole thing a little bit odd. So the top left is a little bit odd and the top right, or the, yeah, top left and the bottom right are the two like weird portions of this maze. And so those ones are the ones that really require you to go uh, counterclockwise throughout the map. So that's why I did it in that order, but you can go different directions too. There's other routes. Um, I think this is pretty efficient though. So that's why I'm going this way. Also, quick tip, when you're talking to a gossip stone, then time is paused while it's talking. It's like, hey, I'm the first one or whatever. And when it's doing that, you can actually just look at your map during that and time is paused. So that's another quick tip for you. You don't have to pull up your map. You can just look at your map while you're talking to a gossip stone. So one of the things I was trying to do for this walkthrough is just not do as much like Photoshop work over overlaid over top of the map. Like I did my spirit checks walkthrough too and I, I spent a lot of time making like really nice overlays for the map to show where all the treasure chests are and stuff like that. And I was like, what am I doing? Like I can draw on the map in this game. <laughs> so I decided I would save myself a lot of labor by just like drawing in game. I decided for this mini game though that it didn't take me wouldn't take me too much more time to do it all in Photoshop instead. But I also liked the uh, convenience factor of being able to like have actual numbers rather than just little squiggles and stuff like that. It's like higher resolution and stuff like that. It just it looks a lot prettier, but it's easier to, to understand what's going on. So in this particular instance, I decided to go ahead and do Photoshop. 
options instead and have overlays that way after the fact for the walkthrough. I realize it's kind of elaborate though. It's like more extensive than what most people will end up being using. It's probably like for most people out there, there's probably dots would be simple enough. But I also wanted to make sure I can differentiate the orbs and stuff like that instead. All right, the final course. You want to go ahead and shoot this eye switch to create a bridge. And we definitely need to go to the top left this time. So continue on to the north and you want to shoot this crystal orb off to the right. This will lower some spikes nearby, which we will pass through momentarily. Go ahead and smack the first gossip stone. This next gossip stone, you have to use the uh, grappling hook to create a slingshot, which should be well acquainted with this mechanic at this point. Uh, one quick comment to make about that, though, too. You can stop making a... Uh, like stop an already created tightrope by just using the grappling hook again. So you'll see I hop up here and when I pop back down, what I did is I just tapped the menu button with my, I'm pressing L on my controller or whatever. So that's what's causing that to happen. Um, so go ahead and go off to the left and talk to the next gossip stone and continue on to the south. So at this point, once again, you want to hop down here to get this one, but then after that, we actually need to enter the maze to the south. So I'm going to go ahead and smack this crystal orb here as long as I'm here to lower those spikes, because we're going to do that here in a moment. But next, we need to head off to the left, actually. We want to enter this little maze and talk to this gossip stone. Now, you could technically go here first. This could be the first one you get, but I think the top left is significantly harder coming from the other direction, so I do recommend going this way first. So grab that gossip stone, then hop down, and you want to make sure you shoot this orb to to lower these spikes off to the right. We'll get there in just a moment. Once again, head back through here and smack this gossip stone and go through the blown up wall that we created earlier. This time it's a little bit different. We have a gossip stone on this platform as well. And from here, you actually can barely reach the eye switch if you look off to the far north. So go ahead and hit it from here. And this allows you to extend the bridge and lower the spikes. Once again, you want to go off to the right and get that one. Go to the far north, and this one actually has a peg here, so you can come, like, clockwise around here too, but I think it's still more efficient to just go directly there. But either way, I'm going to continue on to the south, and this one I actually went through the long path for a second there. actually really like getting this one last because it's right next to the platform where we're trying to go anyways so it just is more efficient to do it this way so you should have more than enough time to complete it although this is significantly tighter than the previous ones we've done and the final prize for the most difficult maze is drum roll please a heart container yeah! so with that we finally have everything here now as congratulations the gossip stone will also gift us with a gold rupee which is worth 300 which is awesome so that completes everything here, and now we just have to get all of the sunken treasure in the northeast quadrant. Now, we will get some more treasure maps, but uh, as a comment, though, too, all these northeastern treasures are worth significantly more. So I believe all of these are even worth 800 or even 1,500. So there's a lot of these that are pretty darn valuable. So if you're hurting for money and you don't particularly need these ship parts, this is a way that you can make a lot of money at this point in the game. There is also two sneaky treasure maps. The sunken treasure for them is in the very top right corner of the map of the northwest quadrant. And to access it, what you do is you actually sail west from the northeast quadrant. So we're going to sail west here in a little bit to get behind Bannon Island, and that's how you access those. So just make sure you do those. One of those is actually Sand of Hours, which is kind of valuable. Um, and one other thing to comment on is there actually is some big pirates here just to the right of the Isle of the Dead in the top right corner of the northeast quadrant. And uh, those guys tend to drop little, they actually drop their own sunken treasure when you defeat them, which has a very high probability of being very expensive ship parts, and you can even find golden tre or golden ship parts from them. So that is actually a very good way to get the golden ship parts, if you, especially if you are struggling with scoring really high in minigames, and that's a more like surefire way to uh, make sure that you get those ship parts. Speaking of which, I just thought of this, you know, I keep encouraging people to like hang on to their low tier treasure because they can trade it with friends, but you know, something else you could do actually is if you end up with duplicates of golden ship parts, you could hang on to them and give them to your friends, and that would actually be a super nice thing, they would love you forever. <laughs> of course, if you're, if you're good enough friends that you're trading ship parts on Phantom Hourglass, you're probably good friends forever anyway. 
So speaking of ship parts, uh, one of the things that happened pretty early on is I got all of the uh, ancient ship set and some of the tropical set and like just a couple bright pieces. I sold all the bright pieces, but those were the ones that were the most common for me. So I actually had all of the ancient set like pretty early in the game actually, but I made myself a mishmash of the uh, tropical set and the ancient set because I figured that's what most people are used to seeing is they have a mix and match of stuff. I also just put the prize postcard in the post box, which I, which I said I was going to do earlier. Anyways, right now I just changed all of my ship parts to the ancient set, which I've had completed for a while now. I just had the mix mishmash because I assumed that's what most people would, would experience in their game, so I wanted to like show how that was useful still. Anyways, but at this point I was switching it all out, so I just had an additional heart on my boat. Um, unfortunately, the, part of what I was stalling for was I was hoping that I would get the uh, some golden ship parts, but I didn't actually get any yet, which is really sad. I suppose technically something you could do is, especially if there's some of these later treasure charts that are near a warp point, you can then like save right before you actually collect that because it has because it's already a high tier treasure has a high chance to be a golden ship part. So you could like save right before you do it, see if it's a golden ship part, and if it's not, load your game and then just keep doing that until you get one. Again, this is only possible for some of the higher tier, like I think that one's worth 150 in my game or something like that. So that one probably is not one of the ones that could be a golden ship part. But yeah, that's the end of this video. If you enjoyed this, be sure to throw a like on it and then subscribe to both Zelda Dungeon and myself, Caleb Simpson, where we have a bunch of more epic videos for you. So join me for the next one where we will continue on towards the all the islands that are here in the northeast quadrant.